we have done up to this point is basically we talked about the general the uh, discrete distributions and we have uh, shown that a random variable the outcomes the, the all the possible outcomes of that random variable which we call support of a random variable and the corresponding probability mass function should be given to complete description of a description uh, distribution and then we have we, we said we, we have basically two uh, functions to summarize these distributions which are uh, the expected value and variance now what I'm going to do is a kind of um, we are trying to learn a language think about like that we are going to learn a couple of uh, frequently used distributions why are these distributions frequently used because they seem to model natural events pretty much in many occasions so the first word the first vocabulary for this new language that we are going to learn is the uniform distribution which means it's going to be a specific distribution so when i say a distribution we are going to uh, learn what the random val uh, variable may take and we are going to f uh, learn what the, the corresponding probability mass function values and we are going to learn what the expected value and variance of that uh distribution so therefore we are going to suggest that there is something called uniform distribution then we are going to learn its properties and once we know that we we can use this uniform distribution just like learning a new language we can use this word in different occasions that may help us so we are going to learn a couple of those words those distributions that may help our life so uniform distribution once i say that i'm sure you are going to think a lot of uh, things in real life which correspond to distribution, a finite number of possible values with equal probability. Well, of a uh, finite number of possible values, it say that's important. So therefore, uh, it's impossible that it's going to be at even an uh, uh, countable infinity. We are going to have a finite number of values with equal probability. For instance, tossing a dice, you have six outcomes six possible values finite and we may assume that they are with equal probability using the classical view so in this case the question may be what is going to be the probability mass function of such a case now the derivation is very simple here it's shown if we have x1 to xn well, whatever you, you may refer any values your real values integers it doesn't matter but n different values and possible values and they are all going to have the same probability mass function then and let's call this c what this c may be since we have n outcomes and each outcome has c probability we are going to use this probability of probability mass functions the probability mass function over all the possible values of x should be equal to c since we have n possible values of c uh, n possible values of x and each of them has a probability mass function value of c therefore c is going to be equal to 1 over n so this is going to be basically 1 over n very simple well, if we are talking about let's say uh, heads and tails a coin tossing it's going to be uh, a discrete uniform distribution 1 over 1 over 1 over 2 zero and one are the uniform uh, the, the the random variable the, the values of the random variable can take and these are the uh, uh, equal probability mass function values and this should be equal to one over two where does that two come from because we have two uh, possible random variable values which is equal to n here and therefore this c is going to be equal to one over n therefore it's going to be one over two well, I get very simple. If you throw a dice, if you are talking about dice throwing thing, it's going to be one, two, two, six. They are going to be all equal, and we call it C. C is going to be equal to since we have n is equal to six, it's going to be equal to one over six. So we can uh, model many events in nature using discrete uniform distribution. Now, once we have the x taking different values and probably the mass function what we need to do is to complete the understanding or linguistic of that understanding the linguistic of that word maybe again using the analogy to learning a new language uh, to find the the center uh, the, the uh, center of mass or the 
variance and expected value of that uh, discrete uniform distribution. So therefore, for this one, the expected value is going to be equal to, again, for all possible values of x multiplied by the corresponding fx value. So it's going to be, again, now what, I, what we do here is, I'm going to assume that this x starts at a, an integer value, and it ends at b, and it increases by one, a plus one, a plus two, uh, which goes to b. So this starts at a, and this starts at b. Think about this a to be equal to four, for instance, and b to equal to 15, and it increases by one unit. Of course, there may be other cases, right? But this is what we assume to make derivation easier. In this case, if this is the case, expected value is going to be equal to from four to 15, let's say, and I'm going to show it with A and B actually, right? For a general formulation, it's going to be the expected value is going to be here multiplied by, okay, I have used K here, so let me use the same notation here. So it's going to be k times probability mass function of k. However, note that probability mass function of k is constant to be equal to c, and c is equal to the number of observations, one over number of observations. Therefore, it's going to be equal to one over this b minus a plus one. Therefore, it's going to be equal to 15 minus four plus one. There are 12 different uh, values that the random variable can take. Therefore, this is going to be, again, I write it like this, from 4 to 15. This time we have 1 over 12 here, k. Now note that I guess most of you or some of you will at least remember this from the Gauss formulation of sum of uh, successive integers. When you use this Gauss formulation, you come up with this rule. So basically, this is going to be equal to b plus a over 2. So for this whole operation. Please show that for this specific example between 4 and 15, this gives the correct result. And that's it that makes very fine heuristics, actually. It's actually just the middle point between b and a, the, the expected value. And without any proof, but using the same logic, variance is going to be found by this expression. But note that this expression is valid only if b and a are integers, and the values that x can take between a and b are by increments of one, if this is the case. Otherwise, you should come up with your own equations and uh, come up with your own results. Okay, let me show you one last example, then it's going to be, um, uh, uh, I'm going to stop with this lecture. So let's say outcomes of a dice to sync model uniform discrete random variable. So actually I have already done that, but let's do it. So it's going to be all one over six here and here. I'm just, All right, so this is our description of the system. Then what do we have? We would like to find the expected value of x. By the way, this is x, this is fx. Expected value of x is going to be equal to using the formulation. Once we see that this satisfies a, 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 a uniform discrete distribution, and yes, as we can see, it satisfies this. And once we see that A is equal to one and B is equal to six, and the rest of the values are by increments of one, then we can use the formulation that we have derived here. It's B over B plus A over two. It is six plus one over two, 3.5. So the expected value of a diastosing experiment is going to be equal to 3.5, which is a representative point for location, but note that it is a value impossible to obtain. And variance of this distribution is going to be equal to B minus A plus one square minus one over 12. I hope I can remember these values. Six minus one plus one square minus one over 12. Did I 
write it correctly. Plus one minus one. Yes, it seems to be okay. And this result, if I can find it in my notes, let me see where this is. I am trying to find, but I, yeah, I think I found it. 2.92. And here the standard deviation is going to be 1.75. And these two values give a nice summary of the distribution. Expected value is 3.5, standard deviation is 1.71. So just like what we have done in the first, in the first lectures, from the uh, sample mean and the standard deviation, we try to come up with, visualize the whole distribution. We can do a similar thing here. Using only the expected value and the standard deviation of the distribution, you can visualize, of course, to some extent, whole probability mass function. Of course, as I said, I said uh, to some extent, because not all the information related with probability mass function is buried inside these quantities. These are actually called uh, the first moment, and this is uh, this information related to what we call second moment of this distribution, we need higher moments to, uh, to, to uh, come up with the whole distribution. Okay, so the next distribution, the next discrete distribution is going to be one of the basic distribution from which almost uh, all of the, actually almost all of the discrete distributions are um, uh, formed. It is Bernoulli distribution. The idea is very simple. Now the outcomes are, either success or failure. So therefore our sample space here will consist of failure, which we are going to denote with F, and success, which we are going to denote with S. Two outcomes. And when it comes to the random variable, this F is going to be represented or mapped to zero, and uh, success will be mapped to one. Uh, remember, random variable is a function which maps sample space to a real value. And then the question that we ask is, once we define the sample space and the range or support of the random variable, then we ask the question, what is the probability mass function at these values? Since we have only two outcomes, we only need to know these values. Therefore, these are, these are specific, to the speci uh, specific to the experiment that we are performing. We usually call this Q and we usually call this P. So the failure probability we are going to denote with Q and the success probability we are going to denote with P. Note that there is a relation between them since they should add up to one because the probability mass function should up to one for all the domain of uh, x values, therefore we can say that q is equal to 1 minus p or p is equal to 1 minus q. Very straightforward. Hence, if you plot the probability mass function, this is what you are going to obtain. So at 0 and 1, we have two possible x values and these are the probabilities associated with each of these values. All right, now once let's just talk about a very simple example tossing a single coin for instance i have already talked about this in terms of uh, likening to or uh, saying that this can be represented as a uh, uniform discrete distribution yes but on the other hand it can be also denoted with bernoulli distribution we have two outcomes heads and uh, tails as you can see let me also get rid of this th these things all right, we can call, for instance, heads as failure. You can write any, you can call it anything that you like. If you like, you can call it success and tails at, as success. So we convert the sample space to a random variable. And once we convert the random variable, then we are going to assign the probabilities to zero and one success, a failure and success. And assuming that using the classical view, uh, assuming uh, equal uh, likeliness or probability for both cases, for each cases, we end up with this result. Note that unlike the, uh, the, the uniform distribution case, Q 
Q and P may take different values here. That's why Bernoulli distribution is not a simplified or only two outcome case of a uniform distribution because these could have been easily different. If this is uh, not a pair for coin, what we may call, then these probabilities would not be equal to one over two. Now, mean and variance of a Bernoulli distributed random variable. What we simply do is we just use the equation related with the mean value. For most cases, this is going to work. I mean, for all cases, it should, of course, work. But in some cases, the, the, the arithmetics may be a little bit difficult to handle. But for many cases, it's simple. So what we do is for each outcome, we have zero. We have the corresponding probability. So zero is the failure and zero failure is shown with Q. If you like, you can write one minus P, just this one. That's okay, but I think this is easier to handle. And the other success, the outcome, which is denoted by one, is going to occur with a probability of P. This is going to be equal to zero. So the expected value of a Bernoulli uh, distributed random variable is going to be equal to P. So therefore, as a, for a simple example, let me say you continue from the previous example, for instance, when you define X as the to toss, uh, coin tossing uh, process with outcome zero and one, expected value of X is going to be equal to P, which is going to be equal to 0.5. So what we call success probability is going to occur with a probability of 0.5. And actually what the expected value of X is equal to 0.5, which practically means if you toss this coin an infinite number of times, as the sample size goes to infinity, the sample average is going to tend to 0 0.5. This is what the expected value corresponds. Now we are talking about distributions with naming or uh, giving some details about distributions. It may be a little bit easier to visualize the meaning of uh, expected value. Now, when it comes to variance, it's the very same thing than the variance formulation here is you can see x minus mu square multiplied by the probability mass function. Mu is already found as p, therefore we just write the p value here. So this is going to be zero minus p squared times, note that this is the first part, x minus mu square times the associated probability of x, which is going to be q. And the other one is one minus p square uh, times p. So what we do is we uh, cleverly use, instead of one minus p, we can write q's. Therefore, this is going to be p square q plus q square p. And the result is going to be in common parenthesis q q times p plus q, which another very uh, simple but slightly clever uh, application of p plus q is equal to one. Therefore, the result is going to be p times q. But in many cases, people also use one minus, one times one minus P. So for this specific example, coin tossing example, what is the variance of X? This is going to be equal to 0.5 times 0.5, which is going to be equal to 0.25. Hence standard deviation is going to be equal to square root of that value 0.5. Therefore a coin tossing example, if you can represent it with Bernoulli distribution, under the assumption that it is a fair coin, the expected value is going to be equal to 0.5, and the standard deviation, which represent the width of the distribution, is going to be equal to also 0.5. Both are going to be equal to each other. All right, let's continue. Now there is a concept which is called Bernoulli trials, which is going to be a, a nice way of combining a single outcome um, uh, or a single experiment uh, outcomes with multiple experiment outcomes. What do I mean by that? I previously tried to mention this difference. If you, for instance, just toss a coin once, then the sample space is going to be equal to heads or tails, two possible outcomes. On the other hand, if you toss the coin two times, then the sample space is going to be equal to head tails, tails heads, and heads heads actually, let me write all of them, tails tails. Now, now note that sample space consists of four outcomes and this single, this 
a single outcome, although it consists of two experiments, is actually a single outcome. And therefore, when we associate X values, we, we are going to associate to each uh, outcome a single value. In some cases, I haven't mentioned that previously, you can uh, give two different random variables. One for the first experiment, one for the second experiment, but I'm not going to confuse you with that concept right now. So what I'm trying to say is that now we can do as many experiments that we can. So each one set of experiment or one train of experiment, right, is going to uh, be uh, comprising a single uh, element in a sample space. So when we employ when we apply a trials a series of uh, Bernoulli experiments after one after another we call it a Ber Ber Bernoulli trial so what are the conditions of these Bernoulli trials they should be independent from each other and there should be a constant probability of success in each experiment the typical example when I for instance talk about that the typical example may be a trial or a sequence of uh, coin tossing experiment. So for those experiments, right, we uh, slightly change the notation, which make to, to make the, the explanation or to, to, to keep track of the derivation easier. We call XI to denote the result of the ith experiment. So here is the idea. We now, we have a sample space. For instance, I say we, have, we, we uh, toss a coin twice then the sample space i wish i haven't i hadn't erased this but again head tails i'm gonna this time write it faster okay without curly brackets inside this time what we are going to do is for instance to describe this sample outcome we are going to write x1 is going to be equal to we are going to represent uh, heads with zero and tails with one x1 is zero x2 is going to be equal to 1. So this is going to be a single outcome. So what we do here is we are going to change these, this representation into a random variable representation, but we are not going to be using a single x to represent each of these outcomes. We are going to be representing x1 and x2, which are going to correspond to each experiment. Now let's get used to this representation. For instance, let's say that we have a faulty product in a batch we produce, manufacture, uh, whatever you would like to think about. And the probability of manufacturing a faulty product is 0.1 at the end of one batch. And we, we constantly, we produce those batches all the time. So the, the question, or let's uh, um, uh, keep up with the question what it says two faulty products in two independent bat batches. So let's say that one batch lasts for one day, for one day, one batch less, and the result is going to be, let's say a product. And the product probability of that being faulty is 0.1. And the second day is we assume that it is independent from the first day. Again, a product is produced. Just like the first one, this one can be also failure or success, failure or success. So each of these batch, batches, each of them is a Bernoulli um, uh, distributed random variable. The product produces a Bernoulli distributed variable because it can uh, result either as a failure or a success and each has a probability here. And this, the, the second batch and the other ones, all of them are independent from each other and the probability of failure and success does not change. So these two conditions, independent trials and constant probability are satisfied. Now, once they are satisfied, we call it Bernoulli trials and we shift to this notation. So this notation, for instance, can be uh, written like two faulty products in two independent batches, meaning the first product is going to be faulty and the second product is going to be also faulty. So actually in this question, what is asks is what is the probability of this event is can be represented actually with this representation x1 is equal to zero x2 is equal to zero and let's go with this before solving the question let's continue with the second question what it says let's first get used to the representation two normal or non-faulty products in two independent batches 
In this case, these x1 and x2, both of them are going to be equal to 1. And therefore, the, 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 the probabilistic representation formulation is going to be like this. For the second question, both x1 is equal to 1, x2 is equal to 1. And therefore, actually, I uh, just uh, tried to summarize the whole thing here, write the formulation of xi, 0 for faulty product in batch i, where here i is this one, and 1 for normal product in batch i. Now, what is the probability of f0? Now, what do I mean by f0? This is going to be the mass probability, mass function of any xi. That's the important point here. Now, note that we shifted from x, a single uh, random variable, to two random variables. However, the probability distribution of both random variables or any other number of random variables, as long as they are independent trials and they have the constant probability, are going to be equal to each other. Uh, and therefore, f0 is going to be equal to 0 0.1. In other words, we can write it as fx1 at 0 is equal to fx2, 0. So having a zero outcome for x1, which means in the first batch run, having a uh, faulty product probability is equal to having a faulty product in the second batch run, which is going to be equal to Q, which is going to be equal to that 0 0.1. And of course, P is going to be equal to 0 0.9. So now let's solve the question. Since the first question asks this quantity, now here is the important thing. This is actually, when I show it with a comma, it means intersection. The intersection of both these events recall independence as in, in independent formulation or independence formulation. When we have two events here, two events independent, we can show this as the product of the first probability multiplied by the product of the second probability. Since these two events are independent, why? Because we are independent trials, so the random variable x1 and x2 are independent. That's actually why all of these probability distributions. Uh, are equal to each other. Anyway, now uh, when we multiply these, actually these could have been equal to each other, yet still that, that it, is, it, it, it may be possible that they weren't independent, but that's a little bit of too much detail for the time being. Anyway, back to question. Uh, when we uh, write these as a product of these true probabilities, this is zero, zeros, and these are failure probabilities, Q square. Since one for one failure probability is 0 0.1, the result is going to be one over 100. And this one asks, what is the probability of having two non-faulty or normal products? Therefore, it's going to be the probability of normal product for each batch run. So it's going to be P squared, which is going to be 0 0.8181%. .81 so, okay, that's Bernoulli tries. It's very easy, as you can see. The whole idea is very straightforward and very easy, but we are going to be using this uh, formulation, this representation uh, in uh, different questions, in different distributions. So it's going to come very handy, as we are going to see. All right, now comes one of the most important distributions, discrete distributions in sciences. It's called binomial distribution. And you are pretty much familiar, I guess, with this binomial distribution in many real life events, or even I think with your intuition, you can solve these questions, which I don't want you to do. I want you to always define the, the or uh, determine which distribution does the, 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 the random variable in the given question belong to, then solve it. Still, uh, uh, you may uh, solve these questions, as I said, using your heuristics. So binomial distribution is basically, we are going to have n Bernoulli trials. So you may think about as a, as a typical case, the previous example I have given, you manufacture each day a single product. And that single product may be faulty or not. So there's going to be always binary yes, no kind of question, but we have N of these uh, questions or trials. Again, trials are independent. Each trial is a success or failure and P remains constant, which is actually the, 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 the uh, properties of Bernoulli trials. Now here is the important thing. 
uh, in the previous case, I have not talked about exactly what is the random variable. What I said was I actually define xi as the outcome of each experiment or I, uh, for each experiment outcome, I have defined a random variable xi, which may take values of zero and one. But I have not defined anything like, out of all these n trials, I'm going to search for a specific uh, random variable. What I mean by that is going to be clear in a minute. This is one of the most uh, typical random variable definition that we may like. Out of n trials, the total number of successes. So we produce 1,000 of these for 1,000 days, or let's make it 1,000 hours. So each batch is hourly. And we make, uh, we manufacture 1,000 of these batches independent of each other. And then out of these 1,000 batches and the, the probability of success or a, a good product is 10%, what is the probability that we have produced more than 950 good products, for instance? So that would be binomial distribution question. Why? Because this whole procedure is a Bernoulli process and the random variable that we are interested in is the total number of successes. Note that I'm not interested in a specific run, X1 or X500 or X997. What are the outcomes of these random variables are? I do not care about this. At the end of 1000 trials or N trials, how many successes, how many one values? The sum of actually these one values, each of these successes, I would like to compute. And the formulation is given by this equation. So here, x is the, the total number of successes for each random variable. Now, we step by step learn more of these distributions. So let's get used to those uh, representations. Once we can, we, we determine somehow the, the probability mass function, we always show it, show the corresponding domain of x. It's important. Here, the total number of successes, the smallest value for total of number of successes out of n trials may be zero. It is possible that none of the products I have produced out of 1,000 is good. Is there an upper limit? Yes, out of 100 products, the, the largest number of uh, non-faulty products that I, I can produce is going to be equal to n. And this is going to be an, uh, an integer here, 0, 1, 2. We cannot have real values. We cannot have rational uh, numbers here because we count each of these good products. Therefore, x is going to be a discrete random variable because it, forms, it is formed from a finite set of discrete values. So this finite, this is also can be seen here, we can only have n outcomes. And here, this x here, as, as I said, the, the random variable that we're interested, n is here the number of total trials, and p is going to be the probability of success. So that is very a stereotypical example of a distribution. Uh, that's why I uh, emphasize this, uh, a little bit more than the other ones, because this very nicely summarizes two points. One of them is here you can see where X is here. It's in a couple of places. So this is going to be actually a function of X. Depending on wh whatever the uh, number of success is, the probability mass function will change. Of course, this is the case. I mean, probability mass function at one is going to be a, a number, probability mass function at five is going to be possibly another number and n is going to be possibly another one. And there is going to be another thing. So here the variable is not only the random variable, but the variable of the function is x. But also this, uh, this uh, uh, probability mass function has parameters. And those parameters are n and p. What is the difference between the parameter and variable? Once you determine for a specific experiment or for a specific experiment, you are going to just determine the parameters. 
what, what I mean by that? I'm going, you say that I'm going to conduct an experiment consisting of 10 trials. Great, N is determined. Then somehow by some independent way, you should find the probability for success. And depending on different cases, there may be some empirical methods. And once you define, you define those two, the, this function has already been defined. What is not known and what is required is for any X value, you can find the probability mass function. And for any set of pro X values, so this parameter setting will give a specific probability mass function figure, for instance. For different X values, you are going to come up with different results. When you change this value from 10 to, let's say, 12, even if you take this constant, you are going to be obtaining another probability mass function figure for different X values. So this is the idea. But first, we should realize that when n is increased from 10 to 11, the domain of x also increases from 10 to 11. So let's uh, try to solve a very simple example and see uh, what we can do here. All right, x is the total number of heads when a coin is tossed twice. Let's see what we can obtain here. So let's see the pro let's, uh, okay, the question is, uh, find the probability mass function. Find probability mass function. So first of all, I should write the domain of X. When a coin is tossed twice, there may be zero heads, one or two heads. I note that I obtain this also from this representation. The smallest number is zero. The largest number is going to be n. All right. Now n is equal to two here. What else? And probability. I need to define a probability so that I can use this. Again, heads and tails for a single experiment, I assume that probability is 0 0.0.1. So to need to, to find the probability mass function, I need to find the probability mass function associated with each of these values taken by x. So f zero is going to be equal to n choose x n is equal to two x is equal to zero so it's two choose zero x is zero x uh, i'm sorry probability is zero point let me erase this part it's too messy all right 0.5 probability and x is zero and one minus 0.5 let me just like that at n minus x x is 2 minus 0 so this is going to be equal to simply 0 0.5 0 1 minus 0 0.5 these are going to be 0 so this is going to be 0 0.5 square 0 0.25 note that this is going to be equal to 1 this is going to be equal to 1 all right let's continue now if at one probability mass function of one two choose one point five one and point five one two choose one is two point five and point five and when you do that the result is going to be point five now please show that yourself if two is going to be equal to point twenty five actually even you do not need to calculate this combina combinatorial uh, arithmetics because this is point five this is point twenty five since x is equal to 2 is the last member of this set, the probability should be also equal to 0.25. Therefore, if you draw the probability mass function value, it's going to be like this, 0, 1, and 2, where x denotes the total number of successes out of 2. These are 0.25, and this is 0.50. OK, I would like to continue with the mean and variance of a uh, 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 binomial distributed random variable. Uh, well, actually, as I said previously, you can, uh, for most cases, use the formulation, original formulation related with uh, expected value, which is x times fx, and you can find the result. Now, for this case, this is a little bit difficult. 
Why? Because if you write it that way, it's going to be x times the summation. And that x is going to be from 0 to n. Recall that. This is going to be x times the probability the, the mass function here, which is going to be nx, probability of x, 1 minus px. So we need to do a summation of uh, this whole term over different x values starting from 0 to n. And we can find the mu value and the, for the variance it's going to be square you know, the formulation again. Now this seems a bit difficult algebraically, so uh, arithmetically. So let's do a simpler, let's apply a simple trick. So what we are going to do is we are going to uh, go back to the definition of Xi related with Bernoulli trials. Remember, we called Xi to be equal to one and zero, whether the I trial is a success or failure. Now here is the very important point. There is this relation between X and Xi. We should realize this. Note that X is a different concept from Xi. Maybe it's a bit unfortunate. Maybe this should have been called AI. Anything other than X so that you can see that it is different from X because x represent the total number of successes whereas what we call xi is the outcome of the i experiment so if you like think about this a but i'm not going to ch change it to a because usually in literature it's re represented as xi so why is this when we at, at the xi values we obtain x because from one to n for n trials for each of these trials when we have success we have xi to be equal to one and what x asks us or uh, requires is to compute the total number of successes so that hence if you add those one values right since each of them corresponds to a success this will represent or this will correspond to this will be equal to x now when we have that relation actually we should realize that this is a very nice deterministic relation between the random variables xi and the random variable x. So that, therefore, instead of expected value of x, we can use expected value of xi. Since actually x is equal to xi. Now, once you do that, we are going to have this representation, each x value. I haven't talked about this yet, but due to the linearity of expectation operator, which you can easily uh, show, maybe in the bonus material, I'm going to uh, talk about that. I'll probably I'm going to give you a link if I talk about that. You can write it as expected x1, expected x2 to expected as x1, expectation operator apl applying on each of the random variables. And now we have this one. We should go. We should think about what does the, what is this equal to? We can go back to Bernoulli distribution case, Bernoulli trials. Since each of them is a Bernoulli Bernoulli distributed random variable e, xi, the expected value of a Bernoulli distributed random variable is equal to p. Maybe during this derivation, this seems very unnecessary here. Why well, find just a very simple thing, expected value of a zero or one variable, but as you can see, it is useful here. Therefore, this is going to be equal to P. And since this is a Bernoulli trial, each of them is going to be equal to P. Hence, expected value is going to be equal to N times P. And it makes perfect sense. It means, for instance, uh, recall the previous example we were producing 1000 batches or 1000 uh, products and 1000 batches and actually we had 0.1 probability of faulty product so the expected value of a faulty product is, is if you call this p as the faulty product then it's going to be equal to 1000 multiplied by 0.1 100 so out of 1,000 products, you expect 100 of them to be faulty. Now, when you say you expect, it, when you conduct these experiments, of course, necessarily it's not going to be the result. Expectation is the uh, uh, long frequency averaging, not that. Okay, you can do the same trick for finding variance. Instead of x, you write this value. Now, this is seen, may seem a little bit less obvious, but you can write this expression in this way. 
but this will hold only if x1, x2, xn are independent. I'll talk about that later. For the time being, just know that this may seem counterintuitive, but this is going to be variance of x1, x2. You can write it as separate elements if x1, x2 are independent. Just to give you a hint here, well, this seems probably, since variance is a taking the square operator, probably this seems strange to you. I mean, from the high, high, high school early on, you have learned that A is not equal to A square plus B square kind of thing. And this very much looks like something like this because variance is squaring. The reason is actually we have in real life, we have also the cross products here plus two AB. Now in statistics, as we are going to see, this cross product will be a measure of dependence between the two variables. If they are independent, this is going to be equal to zero. Of course, not exactly I'm talking about this, this quantity here. Here, it's not going to be equal to zero because we are talking about uh, constant values here, A and B. But when it comes to random variables due to the independence issue, the cross product terms will cancel and we can write this. So when we write this, it's going to be a variance of each element. So what we need is that since they are independent from each other, we just need the variance of this element. And if you go back two slides prior, or three slides prior to that, variance here is were found to be equal to P times Q. Hence, for each x1, x2, we have P times Q. This is N times P times Q or N times P times one minus p. All right. Let's uh, show, solve a very simple example that you are that you are pretty much very much familiar with in your life up to this point. In a multiple choice test, there are ten questions, and each of them has four choices. Now, well, actually, I have uh, I think cut some of the part some part of this question. Now, just randomly assigning the, these answers without uh, solving this question, without even reading those questions. Find the expected value of correct answers and find the variance of these uh, correct answers. So X here is defined as number of correct answers out of n is equal to 10 questions. Now, uh, out of, but randomly answered. That's the, of course, very important point. All right, so you should realize that once you define x by this way, this x is going to be from 0, 1 to 10. These are the values that you can obtain. And once you define those two, you should immediately realize that x is binomial distributed. We usually show it by this way. And we usually write inside the parameters, binomial distributed, and the parameters are n is equal to 10, and probability of success here, since we have four choices, giving equal weight to each of them, probability of success is equal to 0.5. 0.25, I'm sorry. So let me write this more clearly. I think there was not much space here. So n is equal to 10, probability is equal to 0.25. Note that when you write it this way, and these are the parameters, recall the difference between parameters and variables, the random variable x is uh, distributed, binomial distribution is, uh, is a random variable, is a binomial distributed random variable with these parameters. Now, once you give this, this is all you need to do or you need to uh, de de determine or give to determine the whole distribution of X. So now the, the question is find the expected value of X for this case. Expected value of X is going to be equal to N times P, 10 times 0.25, and it's going to be 2.5 correct answers. So this is the expected value. If you were given a, a, a 10 question test for infinite number of times, and if you randomly assign the, the, the answers, 
this is the average uh, number of correct answers. And the variance is, variance is give, going to give us a nice idea whether that 2.5 is, is a very narrow range or the values of X is around that 2.5 in a very narrow range or in a large range. This actually is going to uh, also show you whether that uh, taking that chance and just randomly answering these 10 questions, is it worth it or not? Not maybe as an exact answer, but an approximate answer, I may say. So we have already found that the variance of a, a, a binomial distributed random variable is represented by this equation. So it's going to be 10 times uh, 0 0.75 times 0 0.25, which is going to be equal to actual. As you can see, this is equal to expected value because this part, let me write it that way so that you can see easier, n times p, one minus p, this is actually the expected value. This is a minor point, well, actually a major point, but not for the introductory level of this course. Yet, let me also mention that so that maybe you can keep it somewhere in your mind. Uh, when we are going to be talking about, for instance, Gaussian distribution, uh, the mean and variance will be independent from each other. On the other hand, in binomial distribution, variance is a function of expected value. So mean and variance are related. As we have a higher mean value, right, expected value for binomial distribution, we are going to have a higher variance. In Gaussian distribution, normal distribution is not going to be the case. Anyway, uh, so when we do this calculation, let me try to find the result 1.875. All right. And the standard deviation is going to be 1.4. So 2.5 is the expected value. 1.4 is the standard deviation. At this point, actually, we can do, but we, I don't want to give, uh, try to uh, go into and give you an exact, um, let me say, uh, limits of where the, 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 an, a sample mean could be. That's a topic later we are going to talk about. But 1.4 with 2.5, it approximately means it is very possible that you just randomly assign the correct questions and out of 10, it is very possible that you may have zero correct answers. And it is also possible that a five correct answers may also be uh, uh, not very unexpected. But if you, for instance, ex expect eight correct answers out of 10 questions by just randomly assigning the, the, the correct answers, it's a little bit of a dream, it seems. But the exact calculations later we are going to talk about. All right, now let's uh, just make the question a bit uh, longer. And let's say that what is the probability Let's say that we need only a single answer to be correct. If a single answer, that, let's dramatize this part, that those 10 questions, that those are about a topic that we have got no idea about, but we need uh, only one correct answer. Uh, so uh, do you think that just by assigning these randomly assigned answers, can we obtain that one, rand one correct answer? So what we need to do here is, let's say more than one answer. So at least two answers, at least two correct answers. What is the probability of this? This can be shown as probability X greater than one or probability X greater equals two. Both of them are equivalent representations. Now, how can we solve this? Actually, note that once we know this, we can find the probability of each outcomes. For instance, we can find the probability mass function of zero correct answers. We can find the probability mass function of one correct answer and things like that. So we can write this probability in terms of probability mass functions. And how can we do that? Note that this is going to be equal to probability, I'm sorry, it's going to be equal to one minus probability of x smaller than two or one minus probability of x smaller equal one. Both are equal to each other. So what we need here is 
since this is a discrete distribution, this is going to be probability of, we are going to write all the outcomes that satisfy this condition. X is equal to zero because this X zero is smaller equal one minus probability X is equal to one. And that's all because X is equal to two does not satisfy this condition or this one. So we need to find probability mass function if X is equal to zero. So it's going to be simply 10, zero times probability 0.25, zero and 0.75. which means practically all of the answers are uh, going to be wrong and this is going to be 10 1 and 0.75 so the result is going to be equal to we should calculate each of these values and the result is going to be actually I haven't calculated these numbers so please do so so this is going to be 0 0.75 minus it's going to be 10 times 0 0.25 times 0 0.75 to the power nine. And if you do the calculation, the result should come out to be equal to something like 75.6%. All right. Um, so the next part is going to be geometric distribution. I left pretty much small space to talk about this part. I didn't realize it would take this much space to, to answer this question. It's quite possibly I uh, pretty much improvise during the presentations. That's why sometimes it takes longer and it takes more, more space to talk about all the things. Anyway, now the next distribution is what we call geometric distribution. Now we are still talking about the uh, Bernoulli trial case, but there is a subtle difference. In the previous case, we at the very beginning of the experiment, we determined what the n, the number of trials should be equal to. And then we conducted the experiment with respect to that number of trials. Here, for instance, in this multiple choice, we have 10 questions. So each of these questions, one by one, when they are solved, is a trial. And we know that at the very, very beginning, we are going to solve 10 questions, nothing more. In geometric distribution, we do not know this upper number. Actually, that number is the, going to be the random variable. That's an interesting thing. So the number of trials will be the, uh, the random variable. So now the question may be, how are we going to determine, or in, the, in a real experiment, how are we going to stop the experiments when if the first success is obtained, the trials are stopped? So sample space here will be something like this. Uh, let me first, instead of this symbolic representation, let me first talk about a real life application of that. This may be like uh, a lottery. Let's say, but let's not uh, talk about the national lottery. The probability of winning for that case is very low. Let's say that you, you are uh, five friends among yourselves. You play a lottery among yourselves. And each time you play a randomly, a person wins the game. But they are independent from each other. What do I mean by that? Once a person wins, the same probability of winning the next, day, ne next game or next lottery is maintained. So you would, the question is, how many times you are going to play this lottery till you, you win your first game. So in real life, the sample space will be something like this. You may um, play the lottery once and win. Therefore, it's going to be a single success. You may play once, you may fail, then in the second game, in the second lottery, you may win. Then, th therefore, the second outcome would be fail and uh, success. The third outcome would be the first two uh, lotteries will be lost and the third one will be, uh, uh, will be won and therefore fail, fail, success. And it goes like this four times and it goes like this. So this is the sample space. Note that this is again a Bernoulli trial. So 
this is a single outcome, but it consists of two Bernoulli experiments. So what we do is we assign a random variable, a random variable uh, as a function assigns a real value to each of these outcomes. So one is this one, two is this one, three is this one, four is this one. And what do they represent um, heuristically mean? This one means a single game has been played and I won. Two means it's two games has been played and I won. Note that there may not be zero unlike binomial distribution because with zero means no games. However, this geometric distribution is defined until a success is obtained. In zero games or in zero trials, a success cannot be obtained. A single trial is at least required. Therefore, X values will be from one, two, two, four, and it goes. Now, do we have an upper limit? That's an interesting one. We don't have an upper limit. This upper limit, this actually value is going to, again, it's, it's going to correspond to number of trials. And if you are unlucky or probability of success is small or whatever, there is a, such a possibility that an infinite number of trials will be conducted and still you are not going to be, uh, you are not going to have won the game. So that's an important point here. So this is an infinitely countable set here, X. But since it is infinitely countable, this still is, uh, is represented by a discrete random variable and discrete distribution. So in this case, when you liken your process to that distribution, to, to uh, that scenario this, uh, corresponding to this distribution, we call X is a random geometric random variable with a certain probability of success. Again, the same Bernoulli distribution param uh, probability parameter. Here, the probability is going to be equal to this. And X is going to be from one to infinity. And this one is also a pretty much intuitive meaning. The first X minus one uh, trials here are going to be failure. Therefore, it's going to be one minus one, one minus one, all multiplied together independently, multiplication rule. However, the last trial should be multiplied, should be a success, therefore it's multiplied by P. Unlike binomial distribution, these cannot change its places because when the first uh, success is obtained, the whole procedure stops. Now, without any proof, I'm going to talk about the, those in the bonus part because the algebra is, the, 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 the derivation is slightly involved. The expectation here is going to be equal to one over P and variance is going to be equal to Q or one minus P over P square. All right, now there is an, Interesting property that we are going to also later talk about in what we call exponential distribution in the next like, series of lectures about continuous distributions. There is something called lack of memory property. And what is that? Uh, it means since trials are independent, success or failure of the next sample is independent of the past. Geometric random variable has lack of memory property. Now, what does that mean? Let me talk about that on a uh, simple example. Actually, this is a slightly different, this is a slightly different example to uh, the one in my notes that uh, you probably have in PDF, uh, PDF format, because I would just uh, like to concentrate on that single example. Let's say that um, we have a, we produce, all right, we have again, we have a factory and we produce a product. And that product may be um, okay, a faulty product with 0 0.01 probability and a good product with 0.99 probability. Note that here I define the faulty product as success because I'm going, that's what I'm going to be interested in. And this one is failure. 
Now note that success and failure has got nothing to do what it corresponds to in real life. Success is the uh, outcome which you are interested in, which you expect it to happen. So what you do is this. And let's say that these products are just produced here like this. And one product is produced and you check this one and you check another one and you check this one and this is how it goes. And from the history, you know that probability of faulty products is 0 0.01. Now here is the question. What is the probability that the first faulty product, the first faulty product will be the third that I uh, check. So I started checking this one, one, two, and three. This third one is the fault, faulty one. What is that probability? This is not about lack of memory property yet. I'm going to come to that in a couple of minutes. So for that, we actually think about this case actually what we are interested in this one failure failure success so we just copy this equation here f x is equal to one minus p x minus one times p so what is the probability that x is equal to three means this equation one minus p 0 0.01 to the power two and 0 0.01. So this is 0 0.90 square 0 0.01, whatever that probability is. Now, without actually using this equation, I want you to use this equation, but let's use our also heuristics. It means that the first two products were good. The third one was faulty. Let's say this is the first question. The second one, what is the probability that the first three or the first, let's make it simple, two products will be good? Now it says the first two products, therefore it's not asking a single probability mass function value, just like this example I talked about multiple choices i have erased this part about part b where we asked uh, what is the probability of obtaining at least uh, one correct answer it is similar to that the first two products will be good it means the success will not be obtained in the first two runs therefore here this is going to be equal to what is asked is what is the probability that oh by the way i should have defined x here very clearly x is equal to the number of uh products i checked till i find or i have found a faulty one Okay, so this is the definition of x, my random variable. So now this is going to be equal to probability of x. The first two products will be good means it cannot be equal to one because it means I have found a faulty one. It cannot be equal to two. Therefore, the faulty product is going to be greater than the, 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 the number of trials should be greater than one. This is it, it means one minus f1 minus f2 because again i am interested in all the x values from if you like you can uh, write it that way f3 plus f4 plus blah 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 and this is going to be equal to one minus this value therefore i go back here this is going to be equal to one minus f1 the first one is going to be faulty minus 0 0.99 times 0 0.01 this is the result okay now comes the third part of the question 
let's actually let me get rid of this let me not get rid of this part i'll try to uh, write it here let's see if i can delete given that no faults until fourth product um, what is the probability that the next one is faulty now what this question asks is this one probability that given x is greater than four no faults within until the uh, no faults until the fourth product and the next one it means the next one is faulty which means x if you increase by one x is equal to five this is what is asked now here is what lack of memory means lack of memory says that the previous trials since they are independent or, or from each other does not affect the current state so this is going to be basically equal to probability of x is equal to one which is going to be equal to 0 0.0051 which means okay let's think about this these four products are okay and there's going to be another one coming here is the idea it is as if this product is coming for the very first time uh, or at the very beginning it is the same probability here having good products until this point does not affect the probability of this product being uh, faulty or not maybe in mathematical terms this may seem straightforward but if you think about that it's a little bit tricky here again having these four good products maybe one may think that okay we have four products already good so this one is going to be bad right or this is going to be faulty well if something is geometric distributed no the, the, these four products does not affect the for uh, the, the uh, being faulty or good goodness of that product in more mathematical terms now i can write the lack of memory property i'm going to write it here probability of x uh let's say greater than uh x1 plus x2 given that x1 is greater than x is going to be equal to probability of x greater than x2 this is actually a mathematical representation of lack of memory property again in the bonus material i'm going to uh, give a, 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 a more involved but slightly more involved uh, explanation of this one but this basically means if x1 of these trials have already passed and you ask for the probability of uh, uh, the end of the trials being at x1 plus x2 you can safely forget about this x1 and you just concentrate on that additional number here it is as if this x2 these trial were started from the very beginning okay 